I mean, the first time we met in person, he told some jokes, and I thought they were they were pretty funny. But more of my laughter came from the fact that I was in this situation listening to Axel tell jokes. And <laughs> at some point, you know, from the shadows, Axel said, Dave, I, you know, he had, he had two questions. He said, one of them is, why are you here? You know, because one thing he told me is, is that he wanted Guns N' Roses to be bigger than they were before without Slash. So I just said, you know, that seems like quite a challenge. And so that's attractive to me. You know, I'm here because that if, if that's what you want, you know, that appeals to me because we're going to really have to work to do that. And then the other question was, why are you laughing at all my jokes? <laughs> to which I replied, because I don't want to get fired. <laughs> <laughs> You worked with fucking Axl Rose, William Axl Rose of a band called Guns N' Roses, who's, by the way, back together with kind of the original, sort of the original thing, but they're awesome. What, what, can you tell us about your time with William Axl Rose and, and give us a little insight to what he was like as a person? Um, well, we spent quite a few months talking a lot on the telephone. Um, the whole thing started with, the you know, the, my lawyer contacted me, who was his lawyer, and she said that, you know, he had been uh, showing my picture to his guru for years, waiting for the right time to approach me about it. And so she told me that he was interested in, in uh, getting together in this not I called the manager, Doug Goldstein, and Doug, you know, I basically I talked to Doug for a few minutes. And, you know, he was saying things like, you know, just go in and put up with it and because you know he'll he'll probably you know make a record that won't be that great and then he'll want to reunite with the other guys and that'll be your end and it was like whoa and i had just come from a a manager you know kind of breaking my heart surprising the shit out of me with the, the business end of things abruptly so it was really a turn off and so I wanted to speak with Axel, but the manager said, no, the way it works is you talk to me, I talk to Axel, Axel talks to me, and then I talk to you. And I just said that wouldn't work. So I got Axel's number and called him up. And, and uh, you know, um, his assistant answered the phone, and she and I said, hi, it's Dave. I was just calling for Axel. And she, it was a pause, a long, pregnant pause. <laughs> and she said, okay. And then I waited for quite some time and then the phone picked up and then it was Axel and he's like, hello, like, <laughs> like this isn't how it's supposed to work. <laughs> Why are you calling me? <laughs> and so we just started talking and then we talked a lot for many hours, many days a week for many months. What were you talking about? Like, what, what sorts of things were in these long conversations? Everything, you know, from, you know, it was mostly me learning about him, it seemed, um, looking back on it. You know, it was, uh, there were a lot of things that I, I, I still wouldn't feel comfortable, like, breaking his, uh, you know, the confidentiality of, of, sure, sure, the of relationship. Sure, sure. But, but it was, you know, there was some crazy shit, but it was all heartfelt and, you know, it was like, uh, you know, I started to understand the truth about where he was coming from and how dysfunctional uh, the band was at the time and, and how much stuff that they went through. And, and um, you know, I, I really, I mean, at, at the time, you know, it, you know, my friends would be like, I, you're talking to Axel, and I would defend him because I really, you know, I, I enjoyed him. And, and I started to understand where all the, you know, <laughs> craziness, both perceived and real, that was going on. Um, you know, I mean, we spoke for probably a half, half a year before I even brought drums to L.A. and we got together and played. And even before then, um, even before we played, he, you know, it was imperative that we get everything on paper and practically um, before we even start, you know. And, and it was, yeah, it, it was, it was just fascinating. The whole adventure was fascinating, but it just, it just, for where I was at at the time, 
Um, and I think it had a lot to do with, you know, I still had you know, a lot of soul poisoning from the dynamic of, you know, it, the Pearl Jam experience is the first time I'd ever gotten kicked out of my friend. You know what I mean? It was like the first time I'd ever, um, like, thought something was one thing and then abruptly it was something else. And so I, I really had this new unexplored cynicism that, you know, had crept into every viewpoint that I had with people in relationship. And it didn't lend itself to, to you know, another dysfunctional band, you know? Once we started playing and just the dynamic and, and all this, it was just like, yeah. Instead of having the energy to to look at things in, in a way that, that w would inspire me to put effort into maybe trying to make things healthier or or whatever it was just like a such a turn off revolting you know what do you mean by that because you speak at a very <clears throat> philosophical ambiguous level like are you playing mr brownstone <laughs> with buckethead or something and you're like dude i don't his breath sucks when he, does, he needs to put no, that mask no. back on like to, come on give give me something bro like come on i'm a nerd i need to know no it was it was just the way everyone tiptoed you know like when i showed up with my kit the sound guy saying, hey, do you have any bigger drums? Because Axel, you know, he really likes bigger drums. And, uh, you know, like if he walks in here and sees that, he's, he's you know, not going to like your playing. You know, that kind of stuff. What the fuck? <laughs> you know, that. And, and no, actually, Robin Fink was playing guitar, and it was incredible. Um, there was one experience where, um, like, you know, the, the rehearsal room, it was a big state, really big. Everything was really big. And uh, um, there was one point where uh, Axel's friend, Paul, who was playing living guitar at that point, um, he summoned his tech over a microphone. And a guy got up and walked across this big room and came over to Paul. And Paul was standing there, and he said, I need a pick. And the guy literally went, reached out a foot away to the mic stand, grabbed a pick, and handed it to him. <laughs> and I was just like, <laughs> what is this? You know? So, you know, I, I thought it would be a good idea to go from the stadium setup to a small, you know, we're writing songs setup. Just the so wait, did you stage. tell Axl Rose, wait, wait, fuck this stadium shit, let's go back to this old school way of writing and he listened to you? No, not, not in so many words. You know, he, he actually was there for every rehearsal, which, which I was told later that was, you know, never the case before. Um, but no, you know, it, <laughs> I mean, the first time we met in person, he told some jokes and I thought they were, they were pretty funny. But more of my laughter came from the fact that I was in this situation listening to Axel tell jokes. And <laughs> at some point, you know, from the shadows, Axel said, Dave, I, you know, he had, he had two questions. He said, one of them is, why are you here? To which I answered, you know, because one thing he told me is, is that he wanted Guns N' Roses to be bigger than they were before without Slash, you know? And... So I just said, you know, that seems like quite a challenge. And so that's attractive to me. You know, I'm here because that is, if that's what you want, you know, that appeals to me because we're going to really have to work to do that. And then the other question was, why are you laughing at all my jokes? <laughs> to which I replied, because I don't want to get fired. <laughs> 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 and the room, I had never felt this before. Uh, uh, hints of it with Eddie, but the room, it was like a vacuum. Like flame would not, you couldn't light a cigarette. The air left that room so quick when I said that. And then out of the shadows, you heard, uh, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> and then the air returned. <laughs> but no, it was, I mean, it, it, musically, I mean, it was Robin Fink who was just. I mean, just an incredible presence, an incredible talent, a guitar player. People that don't know, Rob, Robin's played with uh, Nine Inch Nails. I think he's still playing with, right? Yeah. 
uh, but uh, tons of tons of different bands as like the guy. Yeah, he was doing Cirque du Soleil at the time. He had no eyebrows. Fucking, uh, he's crazy looking. Fantastic guitar player, really great guy, sweetheart. And it was also Podboy was there on drums, and and Duff and Izzy, and uh, so wait, Paul. Izzy Strat, wait, wait, wait a minute, hold the fucking phone. And not Izzy, not Izzy, Dizzy. Dizzy. Oh, Dizzy, the keyboard player, not the fucking the guy who started the band. No, no, Izzy wasn't there. Yeah, Dizzy. But, uh, and it was interesting too because Axel was having this, uh, he, for some reason, he wanted to play some guitar. And so he was having a guitar rig built. And the guy who was building it was Billy, who, uh, you know, Billy gave me a cassette. He's like, these are some songs that I'm working on trying to put a band together. And that became Perfect Circle. Ah. Um, but mm. this, uh, this guitar rig that he, <laughs> it was the most unbelievable thing I'd ever seen in my life. It was just like refrigerator sized rack of digital gear and a pedal board. And like, I think it was a Paul Reed Smith. And it was just like, you know, Axel would pick it up and, and then step on things and yeah oof. oof i'm glad someone talked him out of that <laughs> so what do you think about the fact that now he's back with slash and they're bigger than they've ever been are they not really <laughs> <laughs> but kind of i mean they're still playing baseball stadiums and i'm i mean the all the all the girls still know the words to paradise city those Pearl Jam, but you know, have they made a relevant record in the? In why? Why are they still relevant? Uh, ticket sales, I guess. Nostalgia. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I was, le I am less than impressed with their stage presence. Guns and Roses or Pearl Jam or both. Both, but at least Pearl Jam goes out of their way to create a setting. You know, I mean, the, the Guns stage is a little. Yeah, it just seems like, yeah, I don't know. I feel like they might want to work with lighting a little bit more. <laughs> I'm ashamed to say I haven't seen either live, so apparently I have some homework yeah. to do. No, not really. You missed it. <laughs> I missed it. <laughs> missed it. <laughs> yeah. Don't bother. You to Wait, you, you don't want to go see yeah. Slash play Coma for 15 minutes and just stand in the same place? I mean, it's, it's fucking amazing to me and Corey who listen <laughs> yeah. to the songs a million times. Because here's the thing about Guns N' Roses, and I'll, I'll defend them on this. So I saw them, like, I've seen them a few times now. And I saw them at Fenway Park and the first eight or nine songs were like, welcome to the jungle. And like, you know, a bunch of shit off appetite. And it was kind of like you could tell they weren't feeling it. But once they clicked <laughs> in, Corey and I looked at each other. We're like, whoa, is, is this good? Like, and it was like on a song like it was I, I don't know. It was it, it was like some weird song that it started. Like they did a cover or something. I was like, whoa, this is the one. Like maybe it was off Chinese democracy or whatever, but they just hit yeah. it. And then they stood in the same place for most of the night other than just walking to their cue points. But it sounded like if you gave me a fucking soundboard recording, it was like wildly yeah. good. So there is a, the live side of it as far as like it's their ability to play. But then there's Kiss, where when I saw Gene Simmons the first time, I was at the era of Psycho Circus, where it was the original four. But I put on my 3D glasses and then Kiss was able to lick my face. That was a big deal. <laughs> How did we get to that? The no stage present, like no it. stage present from Guns N' Roses to seeing Psycho Circus tour from fucking Kiss, and it was with Ace, and it was with Peter when he could actually play and sing Beth. Huh? Yeah, I don't know what to tell you. I um. <laughs> <laughs> well, after seeing Gene Simmons' Family Values, a couple episodes of that, um. It's just, yeah, so I, I, you know, the idea of watching him, you know, doing the fake blood bass solo and the, yeah, it's just, yeah, yeah. Wow. Over it. <laughs> yeah, I got past it. You know, I know there's some poor, poor Tumak who has to clean that suit every day. I feel more <laughs> about him than I do. <laughs> Plus, I know those, those, those boots got to smell awful. 
I, I had a rant on the neurotic guitarist about people should just hang it up. Cause like some people are great. They age well. Like I think Phil Collins, despite like basically not being able to play drums and like wheeling himself on stage, but saying, I'm not going to do it anymore. He sounded fucking awesome. And God bless Phil Collins. But like there yeah. are some people that are still touring that it's like, just, just stop. Just stop. Full stop. So what, what do you propose they do? Flip burgers? <laughs> no, just stop because they have enough money. Roger Waters, does oh. it, I don't want to hear about his fucking goddamn politics. Oh my God. I don't want to hear about it like this fucking angry, Zionistic, crazy fucking asshole who's like going to schools to, ed to miseducate, to use yellow journalism and hatefulness to basically ruin the <laughs> awesomest hippie songs from Pink Floyd ever and make me feel horrible about everything I've ever tripped to. Uh, <laughs> but he was always that guy. Like Eddie, like Eddie Vedder. <laughs> Like Gene Simmons. They've always been those assholes. That's why it worked. It's on brand. I don't see how you could just stop, though. I mean, that's, I think that's part of it, though. You, like, you, I, I can't imagine at any point in my career just stopping for the point of stopping. I, I, I feel like that's very difficult. Yes. Yeah, so like me, somebody asked me a couple weeks ago, hey, you, you should come by a jam. I was like, ugh. <laughs> jam? Ugh. <laughs> Like why? Why not? It's like because it shit hurts. <laughs> <laughs> well, fair enough. That's that's a good reason. <laughs> but jam? No, I'm. You know, I've reached a point where jamming is like, oh, unless tape rolling. Hey, fuck that. Ugh. <laughs> well, right. Like, I mean, honestly, are you even friends with Sean Lennon unless there's a picture of it? Uh, what? <laughs> well, I was thinking that. You were telling me this whole time. You're like friends with Sean Lennon. You went to the Dakota. You had this existential experience. Wilt's probably being on dimethyltryptamine. I think you were fucked up. But that's great. You went and played on the rooftop fucking concert. You did all that shit. You became friends with Sean Lennon. He likes you, but you only have one picture. Now we live in the age of these fucking phones where everyone takes pictures. So the question is, if the tapes aren't running, if you're not fucking taking a selfie... Did are you friends with Sean Lennon? <laughs> you went way too deep into that one. <laughs> <laughs> We're at that point in the episodes where it happens. I'm gonna just save your reactions to Ben's comments and replay them every time I need a, an accurate like you know, response to the <laughs> shit he's saying. While you were talking, I was squeezing my chair. I felt an anxiety attack coming on. I had to remind myself that yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there was reality before cell phones and documentation. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god I'm like the big brother in 1984 I'm sorry <laughs> it's that jacket is what it is mm -hmm. it's the Shannon Larkin jacket in that jacket you've changed <laughs> <laughs> uh, now I mean I saw this, this, this conversation you had with Shannon so Godsmack is they're, they're ceasing to be yeah so it seems final record Wow. He, 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 well, they're going to continue. I mean, listen, man, if they say, hey, and he said this on our show. So if you guys who are ever watching, hi, mom, yeah, you should go at or maybe metal injection, blabber mouth. You got hi, guys. Um, go back and watch. He said if Metallica wants to play like a radio show and they want to hire Godsmack to go do like the oldies, because like, think about it. Billy Joel hasn't written an album since 1993, The River of Dreams. Did you say In if the Metallica the hi is going to hire God no, not, no, they go. No, they go play a show, a radio show. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> they'll go play it too. But like, if you think about it, like he wants to do the Billy Joel, where Billy Joel says, "You know what? No one gives a fuck about my new music. I don't even want to write new music. I want to go do whatever I do as Billy Joel. But I'll go play stadiums and I'll play uh, scenes from Italian restaurant." Huh. <laughs> hmm. So they're available for parties. Is what you're saying they're, yes. they're done, but they're exactly. available. <laughs> available for the right price. Shit, but Shannon now gets to do the band that he actually wants to do. Not that he doesn't love Godsmack, but he wants yeah. to make crazy, trippy Floyd meets, uh, you know, blues. Like, he, this guy is so deep. Like, there's so many levels right. to him as a drummer that you can't hear uh, in, in a, uh, let's be real, a conventional rock radio song to, like, why Godsmack is hyper successful and we love them. But Shannon plays, you know, uh, Talking Stick. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's, it, it's on to the next chapter is is basically what it comes down to. It is yeah. interesting though. So how do you know that? I mean, you know that it's time to stop. I guess it goes back to the earlier question. It's like if this is your 
you know, you're you're going to go out with your greatest record. Well, how do you know that there isn't an, another greater one next if you decide to stop? I yeah, that's true. That's uh, that's the thing that 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 would you know. I mean, I guess it, it always seemed to be the personal relationship, and you know whether individuals wanted to even go through the motion or you know, like in my case, like to play. Yeah, there are certain elements of you know. The more I enjoy playing, the more late that night I'm going, ow, <laughs> you know. So it, it just, I guess, it seems to come down to what's it worth to you, you know. And yeah, I, you know, it seems like a lot of the inspiration for playing when you're younger, um, the the re- reasons that you enjoy it, all, they change over time, you know. For me, at least, that's, that's the case. You know, there were there were different reasons for for putting forth my best effort. They they changed as I grew up. You know, what are your reasons now? Now, um, I guess they haven't changed in a while. Just to, to create, be creative, and and to just be myself. Really, you know, I mean, that's the thing. If I'm not if I'm not playing, I, I feel like there, it's like, what am I doing? You know, like, there's nothing else I enjoy more. You know. Yeah. Do you feel like you're more yourself now than than you have been in the past? I mean, do you are you feeling now like you're the most yourself? Um. Interestingly, you know, having worked these last handful of years more remotely, um, I feel like I. I I know more uh, about myself. I think that the idea of, of being in a band and, and putting in that effort that it would take on, on other levels than just musical, um, you know, uh, trying to relate to each other and put up with each other and accept each other and create together. Um, I'm probably in a better space to be a part of something like that than I have ever been. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, the way that I'm working now, it's like, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, it's like all I get to do is be in myself because those influences aren't really there. It's like, here's the music, do whatever you want to it, and then we'll play to you. Okay. <laughs> you we know, we like did that with no... Lost Symphony. Do you remember that? We sent you a song, and, and, I, and I love that about you. Can you talk about that experience playing on the Garden of Earthly Delights on Chapter 2 from Lost Symphony, LostSymphony.com, our sponsor, and the band <laughs> that Corey, myself, and Siobhan are in, which we casually don't mention a lot. So, like, but we actually played on a, we played on multiple songs with you, including an incredible cover of Gates to Babylon, where you do the greatest Cozy Powell, I, I won't say impression, I'll say that you are, uh, your, your hands are Ouija boards to the fucking netherworlds, because you, you, you hit like Cozy, and, and we got Mike Mann in, by the way, the keyboard player from the cult, fucking playing the unbelievable keyboard lines. You know, you guys have turned me on to, and, and, and like, you know, um, I have a friendship with Jimmy Bell and Mike and I communicate all the time. And, and there's like, and, and Kelly, and it's just like, so cool. All these little, you know, these, um, amazing people that have, have, have become a part of my life through that project that, that you guys brought me into. Um, you know, that it was daunting at first because it was like, um, my thoughts went back to, you know, Tony McAlpine records and Ingve records. And, you know, when, you know, and my conversation with Joe Satriani, when I told him <laughs> that what he needed to do, oh boy, <laughs> that didn't go over well. <laughs> Wait, what did he need to do? Tell, what did Joe Satriani need to do? Tell me what Sash needed to do as the neurotic guitarist. He called me up and he, we were talking about, he wanted to make another record and he called me up about playing drums on it. And, you know, I mean, I, you know, I just kind of <laughs> said, you know, maybe you ought to just get together with musicians in a room and play some real music <laughs> instead of, you know, being so locked in and all that. So, yeah. <laughs> 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 At the time, it felt like a really normal conversation. But looking back, it was like, who the fuck did I think I was? 
<laughs> so do we? So do we intimidate you as much as Joe Satriani? Because you seem you said it was daunting, but that doesn't sound like a daunting call to Satch, who taught Kirk Hammett and uh, uh, Larry Lalonde <laughs> well, from I Primus. Learned from that. I, learned from, I learned from that call. <laughs> no, I was you know I, uh, once I heard the music and it was just so you know like what I played to it just felt so natural you know and then I sent it to you and you guys responded in kind and. Uh, no, it was actually a really, you know, my part of it was, was incredibly natural feeling. Just, it was really easy and I was excited about it. And then it's like the whole process, like when you would send me, you know, uh, the next, the next layer and the next layer and the next, it was just like, wow, this is really, so, you know, it's something still, I'm really proud of the song that we did and really proud to be a part of, of the, that, the lost symphony world you know just you guys made some incredible incredible music incredible music oh thank you yeah thank you well you ele- elevated you, us you know for sure <laughs> one of the reasons i was able to con you onto the show was because you you asked me and i don't even know what song or if you'll even mention it now but you occasionally will message me and be like are you up for a song as if this is like a joke like i've ever said no to you <laughs> since the day i met you ever and i've ever said no to you because you have me because one thing you have to under, <clears throat> you have to understand about david and he just acknowledged it he finds amazing musicians whether they're through you or somebody else all of his friends, he loves to blow up amazing musicians from South Africa, from <clears throat> from Mexico, just all, women, men, everywhere. But they're all unbelievable. And he'll call me Ooh. up and be like, hey, do you want to play Jeff Beck? And it's with Joanna Connor, <laughs> who's literally one of the greatest guitarists on the fucking planet doing Jeff Beck, which now, obviously, as, you, as the universe has told us, means a whole lot more than when David called me up and said, do you want to do Superstition? So thank you. Thank yeah. you for having me. What's the song? What's the song we're doing next? Yeah, well, thank you for calling me back or messaging me back and saying, I, I don't really hear my keyboards in the mix, by the way. <laughs> 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 I went right in and brought them up. It was true. They were, they were lacking when I brought them up. I was so much more pleased. <laughs> oh. That was funny. Yeah, could you do a little video? That, well, yeah, I would, but I can't hear them in the mix, so I don't really know what I'd be. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just saying. But yeah, it was it was good. It, that stuff is good. What are we doing next? Oh, we have uh, a, a Bowie song that that uh, we're well. That's we, on we've Alan already Johannes. done this. Yeah. So can we talk about yeah. that? Tell us. Man, if that thing ever comes together, it's actually the original singer for Pantera who's going to be singing on it. Um, and it's you and uh, Carmine Rojas from Bowie's band, of course, Rod Stewart and many other things. Um, let's see, who else? Uh, of course, Jeff Nolan. And uh, But, you know, we're right now just waiting on guitar tracks for from Alan Johannes, who is by far and away, you know, one of the... A living legend in my humble opinion um but yeah that that one's on the on the burner so to speak very excited about that one i wanted to have it done for that election because oh yeah i'm afraid of americans <laughs> <laughs> well which is crazy because you asked me to do the keyboards on it and i went and listened to it and i'm like oh my god this song is literally almost all keyboards i'm like what do you want me to do and you're like benny because i sent you kind of like what he originally did you're like do your benny thing i'm like really and i sent you maybe 10 layers you're like this is what i wanted Mm -hmm. so i am very interested to see what the fuck you do with that song because it i mean he was playing that on tour when he was out there with nine inch nails yeah 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 it was it's an amazing one and and the one that i kind of i modeled the drums after was to me one of one of his best live bands but it, you know of course it's still the great mike garson on keyboard who man i had the pleasure once uh tv solace record he had one day elliot easton came in and did a solo for it which was incredible what a great player a great guy um, and then mike garson came in and he was on tour with kenny aronoff they were both with it was that first Smashing Pumpkins tour when Jimmy Chamberlain wasn't there and they were kind of, you know, going Spaceman or whatever. And they came down to the studio 
and it was Rick James's uh, place, um, uh, Comanche, where like all those great Journey records were made and all that stuff. But there was this huge grand piano, and I was in there putting mics on it when Mike Garson sat down and was running through the song, and he started playing Aladdin Sane, and it was just like my mind was completely blown. It was one of those moments, you know, of just, you know, oh, maybe I should have got a picture. I can prove that it really happened. Like, oh. <laughs> can I tell you something? And this is just me oversharing. I have I have a picture of me with Chuck Berry, but I had Leonard Cohen take it. That's true. What? I'll send you the picture, Corey. <laughs> no, I met, so I, I went to an award ceremony. This is how dumb I was. I went to an award wow. ceremony that they gave out <clears throat> awards to, to Chuck Berry and <clears throat> to Leonard Cohen for, for lyric excellence at the JFK Center. It was covered in Rolling Stone. It was a thing. Um, they had Keith Richards and Elvis Costello and, uh, and Chuck Berry had an impromptu jam, which sounds like it would be great, but it was actually terrible because Chuck Berry couldn't hear and didn't realize that they were supposed to play a song for him. So he thought he was supposed to play. So he awkwardly walks up to the fucking guitar and starts trying to play it. Anyway, I go to this after hours party at my buddy's house, who's the one who hosted this whole thing. Keith Richards' people apparently had scanned it to make sure it was okay. He's a billionaire. Like his house is nice. You have to, the front door is a fucking elevator. Anyway, Keith Keith didn't show up, but everyone else did. And we're fucking hanging out. And I'm talking to this old man who's wicked nice. And he has a fedora on. And all these people keep coming up and asking for pictures. And I'm just like, who's this guy? And he's like, I'm, he's like totally interested in me and asking me all these questions. And he made me feel like the only girl in the room, like the Rihanna song. And he, some girl came over and he put his hat on her head. And I said, can I do the Michael Jackson thing? So I put Leonard Cohen's hat on my head, not really knowing. So I go to this back room and Leonard kind of follows me. And there's Chuck Berry sitting on the couch he's totally deaf as a doornail he has one guy standing over in the corner of the room he's by himself I said this is my time I pull out my phone hey Chuck what Chuck Chuck I love you man yeah can I can I take a picture with you yeah and I sit down next to him and I hand my phone to Leonard Cohen and I'm like do you know how to use this because he's old oh my god and and he takes the picture and he was the nicest dude but he took the picture of me and, 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 and Chuck and you'd think like I would have said something smart and I, I whispered in his ear and I said I love your cousin Marvin from Back to the Future that's what I said and he, and he said what? I said that's what they said in the movie what? this is the music you're gonna be this is for your kids <laughs> that's a That's true right story with me asking Tom Bruin if I can go to Sean's house <laughs> I swear to God Corey I, I sent a picture of my Ingbe Malmsteen experience this last night but Corey I'll send you this picture of, yeah, we need of me and Chuck Berry I have a Burberry tie on because it was yeah, a very uh, bougie she she place so I, I, I look all nice <laughs> you put on your best wedding singer outfit <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> Solomon Rushdie was there. It was Elvis Costello, some guy that cured cancer, and then me. And Peter Wolf. Peter Wolf kept coming. <laughs> Listen, this is, I swear to God, it feels like the craziest acid trip. Peter Wolf was there, and he kept asking me, Mr. Goodman, do you want another drink? And I'm like, yes, Peter, I do. And I didn't realize, I actually went up, I saw Jay Giles' band and didn't realize he was the singer of Jay Giles' band until I saw Jay Giles' band opening for Aerosmith. So I, he, he was being super polite to me, just like Leonard Cohen. And I think he was transfixed by the idea that I had literally not a fucking clue of who the fuck he was. I thought I at first thought he was Keith Richards when he walked in. <laughs> it sounds like one of those parties that wealthy people have where they bring in like some like schmuck to like entertain everyone and just bounce ever around. That like, schmuck was me! <laughs> 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 yeah. Leonard Cohen was was smelling me in, man. He loved it. He was like, "Who is this youthful moron? He, he's great." With my hat on. <laughs> oh my god! Only for a moment. Uh, funny how life works, isn't it? <laughs> I, can I tell you, I missed you, man. I, I miss talking to you, bro. Because if we do songs together, but like, I don't feel like I get the full David experience. It's like taking the MK Ultra acid. <laughs> <laughs> way <laughs> it's good to see you guys too damn it yeah and <laughs> it's, it's a nice a glimpse time. yeah it has been and it's a nice glimpse into your surroundings i know last time we kind of saw you on the inside of where you were but we, we have a nice outdoor view yeah and it looks yeah, very peaceful 
It is. I'm way up here on my hill by myself. It's nice. Nice. Me and Steve. Hello, Steve. He's not around. He got bored listening to me talk. Is that the, the dog <laughs> that you found dog. on the side of the road? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, I do. Well, yeah, I found him, but he was in a cage. I purchased him. Yeah, yeah. he wasn't. He wasn't wayward. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then you drew eyebrows on him. Yes, the eyebrows are what I remember. Yeah, yeah, he still gets them every once in a while, but now he's wise. Whenever he hears that pen top open up, he's gone. He just <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> Every once in a while, I'll get to give him one, you know, but he just, won't do the just to mix it up a little bit. Um, mm. So when you're not putting together like these musical projects, like how are you spending your days? Like, that's what I want to know. Um, wow. That's a good question. I go on scooter safari a lot. Um, I have friends all over the place. So I'm always taking different routes and just enjoying the scenery. And, um, yeah, I've been doing uh, a lot of, I don't like calling them lessons, but like, you know, um, chatting with other like-minded drummers and sharing ideas and, and approaches to things, which has been a lot of fun. But no, it's still mainly just lots of music, lots and lots of music, you know. Um, I still have quite a few albums worth of music that I keep messing about with here at home and yeah just i don't really know how i spend my day mostly just however i want that's great that's i mean are valid. you are are you surrounded <laughs> by a lot of musicians locally or is almost everything you're doing kind of through internet um actually you know um there are some guys that i've i've run into here that i really enjoy um uh, doing stuff with and for um but mainly, yeah, mainly it's it's just over the internet stuff. You know, I've been doing a lot of drumming for various projects and one-off songs and things like that. And um, but like, there's a track uh, I brought in a, a drummer friend of mine who lives here to do. Uh, we did a track for Joanna Connor's new record. Which I'm really excited about um, that that. You know, it's just, I wanted it to be really exciting, you know? So I just thought, well, why not two drummers? So we did that. It was pretty, you know, I've never done that before, but it was fun. It was really fun. We did an exceptional job. Um, but yeah, mostly, no, I just, it. if I'm not playing music in the studio, I'm mostly taking in nature or art, you know? So many museums and Knocking out your teeth. Yeah. Yeah. Getting an occasional out accidents. My... Yeah. <laughs> occasional. I'm, I'm doing pretty well it's with as many as I see. <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. But, you know, uh, I have gotten to, to be quite a stunt, a stunt rider on the bike. So, Okay. So like but a comedy right. sketch. As the neurotic guitarist, I'm going to bring it back to my fantasy. So if you were going to be at Fenway Park, Eddie's agreed to do this. You've agreed to do this. Uh -huh. We're doing it for the children, for the frogs. Uh, what's the first song? What's the first song we play? Let's see. I would say just go just start, start off with Go and just play that whole fucking record. So basically the Versus tour, it could be the, yeah, the 30, 30th, is it, is it past the 30th anniversary now? No, it's like two years from now, right? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what, how many years it's been now. What was it, 93? So, oh, yeah, it's going on the 30th year. Yeah, 29. Oh, no, no, 30th this year. Fuck, it's 2023. <laughs> it yeah. just turned 30, motherfucker. Almost, yeah. Right. What did he do? <laughs> uh oh, Google. <laughs> so, so, wait, I, well, I want to see what day it came out. Like, maybe it came out today. It's some weird universal thing. But, so you played the entire... Well, Han, you mentioned to me that you when you recorded that record, because that was the first record that you played in the studio, didn't you play all the drums first? Um, a lot of the songs, no. I, I Well, what it was was um, we tried working with a click track with the whole band playing, and it was like some guys, start, you know, were finished a half a measure before me. Other, <laughs> other guys were finished a half a measure after me. So I ended up just playing. There's quite a few songs on that record that are just, click track in my headphones with nothing else and then I would play the song and then they would track 
go back and, you know, fix the part. So, yeah. One of those things. It was kind of a cool record. Brendan had some really, you know, there were, there were songs like Daughter and Rats where, um, I had, you know, an idea of what I was going to do, but it was on my full kit. And then he suggested, why don't you just set up a kick drum and a floor tom and two cymbals? See what happens. <clears throat> so that, like, you know, and, you know, doing that, the first or second take is what ended up on, on the record, you know? So it was interesting because he, he really knew how to get me to shift thought and, and try something new, you know, which is cool. I think at that point, you know, it was, it, it's a, like the live version of Daughter and the live version of Rats are different than the versions that I played on the, you know, slim down hit in the studio. So, and, and, and to me, the difference is, you know, the, what I played on that little broken down set um, was more song friendly. And what I played, you know, on my full kit live was more performance. Friendly. So you're like Lee Kerslake in the studio and Tommy Aldridge live. <laughs> wow. I, I'd go with that. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, right? That's a thinker heard- for all the drummers. Yeah, That's a good one. <laughs> Have you ever heard the Aussie records that, that they re-recorded rather than paying? Lee oh yeah, Mike Board. Work? Yeah, so so everyone knows. So Sharon Osbourne was a terrible person, and even like uh, Robert Trujillo, the bass player from Suicidal Tendencies and now Metallica, and Mike Borden, the 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 drummer from Faith No More, and played with Ozzy and Sabbath. Um, they had him re-record it so they could fuck Bob Daisley and Lee Kerslake, the original Blizzard of Oz, out of money. So you, at one point you could go to like Media Play, and if you bought like the remastered remastered version, not the twenty two bit uh, Sony remasters, but the the twenty four bit, but the remaster remaster version, it actually had a little sticker on the front saying with new performances by the amazing Mike Borden and Robert Trujillo and they basically redid the Blizzard of Oz so they they took out and by the way just so everyone knows Bob Daisley wrote all the lyrics for like a lot of those songs and like wrote those tunes like Mr. Crowley like those guys wrote those songs it wasn't just like Ozzy and Randy Rhodes it was Randy Rhodes with those guys and they re-recorded them to not pay them because Sharon is like her dad Don Arden who did the same thing to them in the 1980s Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. She's just like your fucking dad. Do they sound the same or they sound different? Dude, I, I blocked it out like the memories at camp. Because I like, <laughs> listen, because here's the I'll thing, man. I'll have to listen, I, I don't know. I, I, I like Mike Borden and I love Robert Trujillo, oh. like when he's not in Metallica. Yeah. I mean, I think they're gr- they're both incredible players. Yeah. So I'm sure it's completely adequate and, and great, but... It's just, it's, it's wrong and it's wrong. It's just yeah. wrong. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. I remember watching, uh, you know, thinking I was going to have the opportunity to meet Ozzy in person. And they basically just kind of wheeled him up on stage. And then somebody clicked a switch in the middle of his back and he turned into Ozzy and then they wheeled him off. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, last time I saw Ozzy, he just left the stage and Zach Wilde did about 20 minutes of a solo. <laughs> so <laughs> that, wow. that was my live Ozzy well, experience. Hold on. But, but you know what? But that's wow. awesome because that's the greatest thing because I rem- one of my favorite stories ever with David because there, our, our interviews with him are so early on in our catalog that we were just learning. So like they're almost painful to listen to because David's telling these beautiful stories and I just can't get my thoughts out fast enough because I didn't take my Adderall that day. And he's telling these wonderful <laughs> things about a like a bit of that here. Yeah, but it's way curtailed <laughs> by comparison. So I remember you talking about touring with you too when you're with Pearl Jam, and that didn't yeah. the bass player was it Larry Mullen Jr. or whatever the fuck his name is? Like would just go That's take like a, like a hike, and his guy would just go take the pose. Like, can you speak to? Cause how crazy is that? Like they're playing where the streets have no name, and then the guy has no name, and no one knows because he's the bass player. Yeah, well, it was actually it was bigger than that. It was like. Uh, there were shows where he physically couldn't show up. He just stayed in his hotel room and the bass player, the bass tech would just go out and hit his marks and play all the songs. And no one knew the difference. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> what was wrong? What was wrong with poor Larry? Larry's the drummer. He was fine. Oh, who's the other guy? 
That's not Bono. Who's the not Bono, the not the edge guy? Yeah, yeah. Not Bono, not the edge, and not Larry. Uh, the bass player. The bass player. <laughs> <laughs> what's his, what's his name? Does he have a name? Did they, did they call him something? Uh, I just called him the bass player. I forget his name. I didn't, yeah. I just, I remember he, he smelled good, but I didn't, I don't remember. His name. I remember, I remember Jeff Amit from, is it Amit? Amit? Amit card? Amix Amit. card? Adam, Adam, Adam Clayton? Adam Clayton! Yeah! Yeah! yeah. He looks like he's from Rammstein before Rammstein. <laughs> Fuck. Come on, man. If you brought up Rammstein, Adam Clayton looks like he could totally fit in. Larry Mullen Jr. could too, man. They both look like they should be in that band. Maybe now. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what they're celebrating. Shooting off fireworks like crazy. I got some fireworks in my garage. I can go start to battle them back. We'll see if we can get that going. Yeah, get this party going. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I've had many of many of a victorious battle of the fireworks moment here. I like those things. I like to tie them all together. So I remember a time when Eddie Vedder, the guy that's a really, uh, he's a bummer. I'll call him Eddie Bummer. Um, had a problem with Ticketmaster or like Live Nation, whatever it was called at that time. Uh, it was something. Uh -huh. uh, Ticketmaster, I think it was. And uh, I mean, you know what? He had a point because they were scalping people. Uh, do you think mm. that he foreshadowed Taylor Swift? I have no, actually no opinion at all about that. I, I do recall seeing that, you know, things that um posts that were like you know talking about how pearl jam was was right you know oh so long ago versus how this but i mean back then we were talking about you know a four to eight dollar service charge say. really wasn't that big a deal you know i mean what, i guess now when you consider that tickets are you know 300 to a thousand bucks and all that. I guess it's different, but are I, you sitting up in the nosebleeds because I had to sell a kidney to go to the newest Taylor Swift show for thirty two thousand dollars? That's what t seats are going in the wow. section on the I side. I didn't even realize that. Jeez. Oh yeah, no, they're that. That's the kind of price you could pay to see Taylor. That's the kind of price she de if she is demanding. Then good for her. You know, um, I don't know if you know if it's one of those things. Is that Ticketmaster's fault, or is that just the promoter and her man? You don't think she sees any of that money? No, she she complained about it to her, her tweets. So she was mad at Ticketmaster. She said, "I don't like how my fans are being treated. That you have to trade a, a, a Ferrari for three tickets. I feel like only two Ferraris would be fine." Yeah, well, you can't always believe everything you read. Those artist types, can you? I don't read it. I hear it. I hear it in these reels, these fifty-three second reels, David. I can't read. I'm a guitarist. That's the new. That's the new. I, I don't want to be on the cover of a magazine cover, isn't it? Uh, I yeah, don't know. Exactly. I, I the politics, politics. Somebody made a lot of money, and and hopefully she made enough to keep her happy. <laughs> it's a very nice way of putting yeah. it. Yeah, it's all that matters. Yeah. I mean, she could go out. She could play a lot more shows more often if she really wanted everyone to see her for cheaper. I mean, insurance isn't that much, but I guess if you if you got an entourage just to you know keep you from getting uh, uh, covered in selfies, uh, you know, it costs money to tour. <laughs> it almost seems like now with technology and cell phones and all this, it's like there's so much more documentation. Of people trying so hard not to be assholes to their fans and tell them no, I'm eating, you know. Right. Yeah, that's true. So I'm, yeah, it's, it's painful to watch. You know, it's like yeah, it's, I, I just saw this thing. It came up, and uh, you know, I really pay attention to anything Bieberish, but it was Justin Bieber um, explaining to some teenage girl that look, you know, I'm just coming home from the night of being out with my friends. And I don't want to take a picture right now. I just want to go yeah. in my house. And, and, you know, and it's kind of being like, you know, like, you know, he's mistreating his fans or whatever. It's just, it's, yeah, it's blown way out of proportion. 
But, you know, I've seen that, and I gotta, I gotta defend the Beebs because it's just him, like very earnestly being like, "Hey, like you just showed up at my house. I don't know who you are. Um, I'm tired. I don't feel well. Yeah. I'm just getting over this palsy thing where I can't even move half my face. <laughs> and you want to take a goddamn picture with me? And frankly, like it's kind of creepy yeah. that you and your friend are stalking me at my house, knowing where I live, and I have a guy here at the door to tell you fuck off, David Abrazies at seventeen, because I want to go upstairs <laughs> and smoke a bowl with my hot ass fucking wife and my children in the other room. So can I go fucking take a shit now, or is that cool with you? And that's what people don't understand because you have access now. You have too much access to people. I know so much about people. Do you remember back in the day when you didn't know like what gum Axl Rose ate? Chewed? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe ate? So at the same time, I mean, you know, it, it would have taken a lot less energy just to take the fucking picture and be nice than it would to spend the five minutes explaining that, you know. I mean, of course she knows it's his house. She's a fan. She bought it for him. Take the fucking picture and go inside. Huh? Huh, but she Again, made a, a huh, but, but she was filming it, so she made a reel for him for free in portrait mode because she didn't know to take it in landscape because she was anticipating <laughs> reels so that he could do a press release to everybody who watches memeology, which has become realology, and so that they could be wow. informed. Please don't fucking stalk me. <laughs> Far out. You can't believe anything anymore, can you? <laughs> <laughs> that what is reality? Huh? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it used to just be clear, clear of the Inquirer, you know, but now it's, it's uh, yeah, it's everything. Now it's just the internet. Know. It's, it's just, just everything, everywhere. Yeah. You know, it still amazes me. There's some statistic that it, it's still not everybody's on the internet. <laughs> that, that's miraculous. Amazing. I'd love to know the people that are not. They're probably yeah, very uh, interesting. His people. neighbor's blowing off fireworks. <laughs> They're probably... <laughs> interesting as well as um you know happy <laughs> absolutely probably question they have a lot more stupid questions in their head <laughs> now you'd think that uh, the stupid questions would go away but people still even with access to every bit of information possible still have very stupid questions and stupid opinions that they could easily yeah. find the answer to but still prefer to spout out the joe rogan experience <laughs> right <laughs> True. Yeah, true. Nothing else to talk about, I guess. But wait, don't you think that Joe Rogan's right that we should all just go into like depri uh, you know, sensory deprivation chambers and take a bunch of DMT and get to our true selves and then just and then just buy Teslas and smoke fucking cigars? And watch UFC. <laughs> I, That's a good plan. You know, I, I changed the channel. I've been watching just watching the really high Mike Tyson talk to people. It's been He's great. <laughs> Who would have ever won? David, who would have ever thought later in life that Mike Tyson would be this old, wise guy with a fucking face tattoo being like, you know what? The pigeons will teach you discipline. Oh, my God. He's amazing. The he's pigeons will teach you discipline, David. <laughs> I don't know if you know uh, uh, over there, Siobhan, but uh, he has pigeons and they fly. I and he even not. had a show. He actually had a show about him using pigeons to send messages <laughs> to people. Okay. I'm I'll have to check this out. I'm not aware of this. <laughs> he's a he's a he's a deep guy. He, when he's not biting off ears, he's uh, he, he's he's totally uh, setting the pigeons into the air. And now he's become a spokesperson for cannabis. And I swear to God, he's like sitting down with Be Real from Cypress Hill, and he's the chillest motherfucker. Other than if you're next to him on a plane and you're fucking with him, like who's that d dude that's like gonna take a video and they think that they're gonna get Mike Tyson angry, and they do, but like they just look like a douchebag, and then you're just like, well, I hope Mike Tyson hits that dude. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact that he started a company putting out edibles. And their ears with a bite missing from them. Oh, nice. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's fucking it's great. Called, yeah, it's called Mike Bite. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> was that a Shark Tank idea like Mr. Wonderful? Like, hey, let's exploit this. <laughs> Isn't Kevin Hart on Shark Tank now? <laughs> Kevin O'Leary. Oh, Kevin Hart. Yeah, he is. <laughs> Kevin Hart. Yeah, Very that, different that guy. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. one one of them has talent. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> the guy that has a great portfolio. Yeah, I still don't know what's going on. Yeah. 
That, that was left ambiguous deliberately. I love Kevin O'Leary, though. I, he, he eats at good steakhouses in Boston, and I see him from afar. I'm like, I have ideas. And he always has his people just look at me. And I, we, so I, 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 yeah, I, and I do, but like, you know what? They don't let me pass the casting for Shark, for shark Tank. You know, like, I mean, I, there's, so, there's so many things that we could be doing, man. The artificial appendix needs a place in this world. <laughs> Where have I we ended up? I don't know. Oh my god! <laughs> it's a metaphor for for society. Yeah. Well, we've got, we've gone the full spectrum of conversation today. Yeah. You got the spectrum part right, <laughs> David. What uh, what do we have to look forward to in in the in the coming weeks and months from from you? Ah, okay. An announcement. I'm making an announcement. Here it is. The first you'll be the first to hear it. Coming to you on 2020. Here it is. This guy, Jeff Woods. Um, there's two Canadian drum makers that have become very good friends and, and always had respect for, but even more so now um, that I've gotten to know them. Uh, Ron Dunnett and Jeff Woods. And Jeff Woods and I are putting out the David Aberzee signature snare. Very yes. exciting. Awesome. Yeah. I'll check later. All I know now is the one I play is the one on the Lost in the album. And, um, and we have finally come up with the color and the design. Um, but as far as, you know, the, the exact specifications, I know it's a 12 by 7, but I'll get you the rest soon. 12 yeah. by 7? Because oh, yeah. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> is it made of, is it made of even wood? Is it metal? What, what is this thing? Yeah, it's wood. No, it's wood. And he, he had sent me one as a gift, and, that's, and I got it right before I recorded the Lost Symphony track. And it's just been like, wow, this thing is amazing. And one day, you know, we were we were chatting back and forth, and uh, I just mentioned that you know that, that that is like this sound that that represents me in a lot of ways. And he said, "Well, let's do it." I'm like, "Okay, so we're doing it this year. Great!" But we just last night we Amazing. finalized the uh, finalized the color, and you know, basically what's going to separate it from all the other ones. And, um, yeah, I, I should have, I mean, I know I've got it written down, but I don't have it memorized. The, uh, it's okay. You know, the, the, the layer wood and all that other stuff. Well, can I just back. say though, that first off the people in Canada, they take good care of their trees. It's, I mean, they, they, I mean, if you've been to Canada, it's a clean place. All it is is strip clubs and trees. And I know that first off their name is woods. All right, like how did you not expect them not to be able to craft a beautiful thing out of wood? It's right in the name. Yeah. It's literally like Xerox. Yeah. Like Ron Dunnett, he, he went and done it. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you sharing that with us. Where are they going to be able to buy this thing? How do we get one? Well, I want one now. I want one literally yesterday. Don't worry, I'll get you one. But there, there'll be, uh, uh, I, you know, I'm sure they'll be for sale in the local music store. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, however we can share it. We'll, yeah, yeah, let we'll, us know. We'll pump the shit out of yeah, that. I will. Did those I'll exist? Let you know. <laughs> music stores? I hope so. Don't they? Let's I hope. know drum there's, shops do. Yeah, there's still a few kicking around. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, I guess Sweetwater. <laughs> <laughs> the, the country's drum shop there. <laughs> Is that, Guitar center still exists out there. Yeah, we got a. Yeah, more they're, or less. They're a little. They're a little. Uh, you know, <laughs> sad sometimes when you walk yeah. in, but uh, they're Especially still there. Especially after COVID. Yeah, can I give you a metaphor for what guitar oh, center was like? Like, like? I went. I, I went. I went in there and I bought a, a brand new Gibson, a Les Paul, and it came with a beautiful aluminum iodide, like this beautiful brushed silver case. It had like the sticker you could peel mm -hmm. off. The manager brings it out. First off, peels off the sticker on one side, and I watch him like like I didn't know what to say, but I'm like, please stop! I'm a collector, please, please, please. Like, why would you ever? Like, I love doing that anyway, but why would you do that? And then he tries to open it for me, yeah. and doesn't realize there's a, there's a latch on the other side. So he's trying to open the case. He's gonna break the, the the latch on the other side of the case, and looks up at me, and he's the store manager. He goes, 
I'm thinking about buying a Gibson and, and starting to play myself. And that was the store manager of Guitar Center. The current wow. state of affairs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess all the old, old school guys are growing weed now. <laughs> With Mike Tyson, dude. That's the, that's the yeah. parting lesson. <laughs> yes. Oh, man. So, so David, can I can I ask you something? Can you will you please come back again sometime? Like not two years from now. Like our our show literally doesn't even make sense anymore. We missed you a lot. We it was so we were happy to have you back. Thank you so much. I like your new smart sassy look. Oh, there, thank you. Lady. Well, as it turned out, I'm I'm incredibly far sighted, which worked out well for me in orchestra because I could see the music far away, and then I was like, why am I getting headaches when I look at my phone? So. So, turns out I've needed glasses for a while. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it happens. It happens when you hit about 30. What are you, about 28, 29 now? No, 33. <laughs> but thank you. I'm glad that I look 28. Uh, I'll take it. <laughs> oh, man. I was actually going to say much younger, but I didn't want to press my luck. Oh, no, that's all right. I'll take even younger. <laughs> <laughs> Corey, what have you been doing? What have I been doing? I've been sitting in this dark basement recording studio for the since since our last episode. That's what I've been doing. Not much has <laughs> Basically, changed. Basically, <laughs> this is how we see Corey every time. <laughs> Accurate. No, I, I am I am very grateful to be working with a lot of different artists, producing music, mixing, doing all sorts of fun stuff. Right working on. on the Lost Symphony project, working on 2020. So, I get all my outlets through this little camera here. It's how I see the outside world, but it's it's been fun. Definitely can't yeah. complain. They need to make like a, a fake sunlight. To, yeah, to I know. Them, you know, I, I do have a small window over here, but it's uh, yep. it's underneath the deck, so I get, I get indirect sunlight, just enough vitamin D to keep me alive. Right. Uh, <laughs> Just I, have, I have no windows down here, but I remember going to Longview Farm Studios in North Brookfield, Massachusetts, RIP, and they had built a room for, for Keith Richards because they did their 81 tour and like practiced there. It's a farm in the middle of nowhere. And they had an opaque light that was in the shape of a window, but it, there was just a, a light bulb behind it that they had dimmed out. So that he could think that there was sort of light coming into the room, but not like actual sunlight. <laughs> and that was Keith Richards. Awesome. They called it the Keith Richards room. <laughs> Have you ever heard about the, um, what was, I forget the name of the, uh, Stevie, uh, Stevie Wonder Studio. And they called it, you know, when you worked there, you were on Wonder Time because oh. there were no windows because he didn't care <laughs> light or day outside. And that the musicians, it was, you know, it's like he would sleep sometimes for an hour and then want to work again. Sometimes he'd sleep for 20 hours, just like they were on his schedule and they wow. never knew it, what time of day it was when the sun, the sun was down. <laughs> Love that story. <laughs> that's, that's the dream, just to have your but own one, time zone. Supposedly one of the most, one of the most uncomfortable studios to, to work in because it was, you know, he, he didn't require the visual so do you think that maybe some of the guys from his studio like were like they saw the guy from pearl jam running at him and they're just like let it happen <laughs> no i was quick i was quick <laughs> there's our call back no i went both in the room flew around this corner flew around this, there was a big beam in the middle of the convention center and i just I was running after roger and i went around that corner and just shoulder down boom, and i just remember Braids and beads is clacking, and then I look down, and Stevie Wonder is laying on his back, <laughs> and my hand is extended. So I grab my hand. I look up. He didn't look up. <laughs> so yeah, I think he is in fact blind. Actually, the rumors are false. <laughs> Scientifically proven. David, oh, yeah. oh my God. thank you so much for hanging with us, man. Yeah, David, it was really awesome to see you. It's great to see you guys, too, and nice to talk with you again. And let's do it again real soon. There are a lot of things going on, um, and we'll, we'll that'll give us something to talk about next time we talk. Hell All yeah. Right. Guys, yeah. check out 2020-D.com. Like and subscribe to the podcast. Make sure you check out 
David's previous episodes, and Ben wants to say something really quick. LostSymphony.com, The Garden of Earthly Delights, off Chapter 2. We have David Aberziz with our friends Jimmy Bell, Kelly uh, from Lost Symphony. We also have Joey Concepcion. We have Rusty Cooley, um, Ollie Herbert. <clears throat> R.I.P. We, we miss Ollie. So the fact that we were able to do that with David was kind of the last song we actually did with Ollie that we kind of started while he was still still on this planet. Um, you know, so we don't really talk about it a lot, but David has been kind enough to post it. So thank you, David, for being a part of it. And uh, we'll certainly put, we'll, Woods... We'll put a link, link in the description to the, the Yeah, song. and certainly Woods uh, drums. I mean, I just want to say that, you know, the reason that I wanted drums in my studio is because I the Canadians. Because Kelly from Lost Symphony is Canadian and uh, Conrad from Lost Symphony is Canadian. Canadian, and I and I realized that Rush is Canadian, and uh, Triumph is Canadian. And, uh, <laughs> we don't need so, to go through the yeah, whole no, no, roster but, of but bands you, that but are hold Canadian. On, but hold on. Oh, listen, but if you haven't heard oh, Triumph, oh, 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 wait, April Wine is Canadian, and April Wine's drummer played Milestone drums, and Ron Dunnett, who's made uh, some incredible drums for me, he uh, has brought back the Milestone drum company and there's a snare drum waiting for me to pick it up right now so there'll be a uh, an unboxing of that but inc another incredible drum uh company is brought back to life by the amazing ron dunnett unbelievable so something else i wish ron dunnett was american so he can run for president Canadians. <laughs> uh, to the canadians <laughs> <laughs> he'd make a good president <laughs> he really would <laughs> guy takes no shit <laughs> and on that note you've been 2020 motherfuckers Thanks so much thank you <laughs> thank you so much david uh sharon so anyway i do my audition with ozzy ozzy comes on uh the next day ozzy comes in we we uh change uh studios and we go to a big studio it had a massive stage on it and uh i did uh five songs including a guitar solo and I sit down with them after, and they said, uh, well, Jimmy, here's the deal. It's between you and Zach. And, you know, if they didn't like me, they didn't have to say, you know, say that, but they said it's between you and Zach. And they took me out to dinner at this really exclusive place. I went back to Ozzy's bungalow, then Brandy Castile took me to uh, the Troubadour. It was just one, an amazing uh, experience. Uh, but then I was on a plane on, on the plane home the next day and 